Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you all for giving up your time to be here this afternoon. And uh, welcome to my first inaugural lecture at uh, King's College. The topic will be on, uh, will there ever be a cure for osteogenesis imperfecta? Uh, before I start this lecture, there are a few things which I need to get out of the way. Uh, first of all, and uh, foremost, I would like to thank Katie Gallagher, who, uh, without her, I would not be able to be here talking to you all today. Unfortunately, she cannot be here because she's in uh, America, enjoying herself with her husband. But she is uh, obviously disappointed that she can't be here today, but uh, we are recording this, so she'll be able to see this when she gets back. Secondly, I would like to mention that today's lecture is being recorded for educational purposes purely for my A-levels, which I will touch a bit more in the future. Uh, but for most of the lecture, the uh, camera will be on myself, but during the question and answer session, the camera may move towards the audience just in case, uh, so we can prove that people were here. Uh, but if you do not wish to be filmed, I would ask that you uh, specify before you um, start your questions, so we are able to either keep the camera on myself, or we can stop filming if you would prefer that. Uh, I would also uh, like to say that there is a suggested Twitter hashtag for this event, OI Kings. So if you are uh, so inclined, I would advise you to get your phones out and start tweeting. Uh, and also, it's a, supposed to be an interactive lecture, so um, if you do have any questions throughout the duration of this lecture, please do tweet and I shall be tracking that on my laptop. Uh, as I realise how difficult it can be to keep questions throughout the duration of a lecture in your head, so I thought this might be a good way of getting out there. Right, with those out of the way, it's, uh, I'd like to tell you a little about myself. My name is Tinez Ganesh Murthy, I am 19, and I am in my final year of A-levels studying in New Cross. I'm hoping to study politics and international relations at university at degree level, and I'm also a member of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, with whom I advise on issues around children and young people care in the UK. The idea behind this lecture uh, came from one of my projects for college, as I mentioned before, I'm an A-level student, and as such, I thought it would be a good idea to do an extended project on this topic, uh, this topic being my condition, which is osteogenesis imperfecta. As it was a topic which I felt relatively comfortable with, and it's something that I felt relatively comfortable working with, but I, and, but I knew there was so much more to it than I knew. There were other reasons why I chose to do this project as well. I... Uh, also found that while looking into my condition previously in the years gone by, all the material that was available was rather complex and it was beyond my needs. And I always wondered why the information available was had to be so complex, why it had to be so out of reach for normal individuals like myself who doesn't, who don't possess a medical degree. And uh, the third and final reason was my parents. My parents, when I was really young and before I was diagno diagnosed, were accused of child abuse and were arrested. I shall touch more on this further uh, later on in this lecture. But this wanted me to raise awareness of OI uh, even more, and, through and I hope to achieve this through doing talks like this and lectures like this in the future. And I hope it will reduce the number of people who have to go through what my parents and I had to endure. Now, osteogenesis imperfecta, what is it? Well. The term osteogenesis means the formation of bones. Hence, the literal meaning of osteogenesis imperfecta is the imperfect formation of bones. The ineffective bone formation is caused by genetic mutations to genes which affect either the quantity or quality of the production of collagen which is produced in the body. Collagen accounts for 30% of the typical human body weight. Collagen is a group of naturally occurring protein which is essential for strong bones and muscle structure. It is found in the tendons, bones, and parts of the eye, such as the cornea and the sclera. The complications which uh, are caused by the mutations to the collagen producing genes are that defective collagen forms around the ab abnormal mold uh, of bone, and hence the collagen reinforcing the bone forms improperly as a result. The badly formed collagen is more susceptible to being broken down by osteoclasts, which are the cells which break down the molecules of the bone in order to reform it again, which is a normal bodily process. Additionally, the osteoblasts in charge of reforming the bone molecules are unable to work efficiently uh, and uh, to reinforce the abnormal collagen fibres, and they find it very hard to absorb these uh, abnormal fibres. And it makes it very difficult for the osteoblasts to make them, and then obviously transfer them outside to place them on the bone structure. 
Consequently, this makes these cells very inefficient in the way in which they produce additional bone proteins and are slower than usual to divide and make new cells. This can cause particular problem as the body demands that the new bone cells to make more bone, particularly during childhood. During childhood, as you all know, uh, new bone is needed in order to carry the increased stature and weight of the growing child. Unfortunately, the only bone that the body can provide of someone with OI still contains the defective fibres. Uh, un uh, so the strength is never improved. The spiral, as I like to think of it, of the ineffective bone formation is never ending. Ultimately though, this ineffective bone formation goes to demonstrate why those with OI, including myself, experience extended healing periods if they were to break or fracture a bone, compared to individuals without the condition. For example, it would take me on average uh, a good three to four months to fully heal from a fracture of the arm, and it could take me upwards of six months to recover from a fracture of the leg. Fracture of the leg. There are currently eight types of OI, uh, which have been identified, and you can see them outlined behind me. Uh, they all vary in terms of severity and symptoms. You are also able to see which particular gene defect causes these conditions. I have type four osteogenesis imperfecta caused by uh, mutations to the COL-L1 and the COL-L2 gene. Uh, most of the conditions are caused by dominant genes, but the final two types, 7 and 8, are caused by recessive genes. Uh, uh, alleles in the genes, I should say. And it was first discovered in 2006 by Dr. Joan Marini and her team at the Eunice Kennedy Shrine and National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. And we shall hear more about her and her work later on. However, however, firstly, I would like to go through some of the main symptoms or signs that people with OI present. Firstly, those with OI have comparatively shorter stature compared to those without. Luckily, I do not have those symptoms. I am a fabulous 5 foot 6 inches, for those interested. Uh, and also, uh, people with OI tend to have blue sclera, which is the... There are blue specks in the eyes, which can be noted, and that uh, can, sometimes can be used to diagnose the individual. Uh, and also, individuals can pre be present with bones of the arms, as well as bones of the leg, as well as they experiencing curvatures to the spine, uh, some, something which is known as scoliosis. I have scoliosis of the spine. My spine sort of goes straight, but it also turn, comes outwards and then curves sideways as well. Uh, this can be corrected with surgery if this condition gets worse, but at the moment they haven't uh, considered surgery as an option yet. They can also experience loss of hearing, typically uh, uh, deafness at a very young age. This loss of hearing uh, happens normally between teenage years to being a young adult. I have to be tested uh, for my hearing every year. I had my testing, uh, hearing tested a couple of years ago in September, and I'm happy to report that my hearing is fine, which is always good news for someone my age. The loss of hearing can occur through fractures of the tiny bones in the ear. Also, I have found that people with OI have poor development of the teeth. Again, I have been fortunate enough not to experience those symptoms, but I have to be under constant dentistry care and at Guy's, college, uh, Guy's Hospital just to make sure that my teeth aren't getting worse. Uh, another complication which I, I have experienced, which has been put down to my OI, is respiratory problems. As, people, as generally most people with OI are confined to wheelchairs, it makes, it makes it difficult for them to cough and clear their lungs, as well as a person who can walk and is able to do th things regularly, uh, as in engaging in sports and such like. This has meant that I, along with many other people, have an increased risk of getting flus, chest infections and even pneumonia. A couple of years ago, I had a bad time of it. I had an awful chest infection, which meant I had to be in hospital for over a week receiving uh, oxygen and IV antibiotics and IV fluids for more than three days. It was not a nice experience, but this means that I have to be especially careful during winter times, not only to, due to my bones being weak, but also to avoid getting colds in my chest. In order to monitor the condition of my lungs, I have to go and get a lung function test carried out uh, yearly in order to make sure that my lungs are functioning as they should. And I also receive chest physiotherapy in order to make sure I am as safe as possible during cold winter times when I'm most likely to be at risk. There are a few interesting statistics in terms of the rates at which OI is uh, found in the general population. In 
in the United States of America, it has been estimated that between 20 to 50,000 people may be affected by the varying types of osteogenesis and perfecta. But out of a population of nearly 3 million, that seems quite a small number, and it's, that's why it's not a condition with such a high profile. The, this slide demonstrates the uh, prevalence rate of osteogenesis in the general public and the uh, way that it affects people during live births. And as you can see, type 4 is very rare internationally, and it's only been observed in tribes in Zimbabwe. So my type is rather rare, and hence it's very hard to diagnose as well. I believe in order to fully understand the full impacts of OI, as well as to comprehend the difficulties in finding a cure, we first need to understand the difficult, the potential difficulties in achieving a diagnosis, as obviously without a correct diagnosis, treating it becomes very difficult. The difficulty arises from the varying genetic mutations which I mentioned before. In order to provide uh, a bit of more context to this, I would like to tell you uh, my diagnosis story. When I was born, I wasn't showing any of the symptoms of, of OI. Uh, there was no family history of OI in my uh, family tree. I was a normal happy child. The only concern that my parents had that I wasn't able to walk. And when they took me to the doctors, they said there was nothing to worry about and that eventually um, I would start to walk. But after eight months after I, was being, after I was born, I started fracturing my bones multiple times, one after the other. One day, when my parents took me in on injury, they got arrested uh, as they believed that I was being subject to child cruelty and the social services wanted to take me away from my parents. But my parents would not give in. They said they'd have to die before they took me away from them, which still makes me very teary to this day. There was a tremendous court case which went on for several months while my, and during that time my parents were kept uh, in a house where they were monitored 24-7 and uh, they weren't allowed to have visitors and they weren't allowed to leave without uh, people monitoring them all the time. This went on for a long time, but in 1996, uh, after two years after I was born, I was at GOSH when I was crawling around normally and I was clinging onto the chairs, walking, and one of the consultants noticed I fell over and my, one of my legs swelled tremendously. And then they noticed that um, that wasn't normal for someone my age to do that. So they ran further tests, um, the tests which I will talk about in a bit, and they discovered that I had OI. This meant that my parents were released, but this to, to this day, there has not been enough evidence, the case was not closed um, because there was not in enough evidence, as the judge said back in 1996. However, there are some methods and systems in place at the moment which can be utilised to try and pick up on the condition before birth, i.e. during pregnancy. Or if not picked up before birth, there are a couple of methods which can be used uh, to detect it after birth. Firstly, I will talk about methods of trying to diagnose the condition before pregnancy. Uh, through my research, I have identified three main ways of achieving this, uh, which you can see behind me. The three main methods are ultrasound, chronionic vitreous sampling, and amniocentesis. I shall discuss each of these in turn. Uh, sorry, ultrasound. Ultrasound is the least invasive procedure of these three, and it is used to examine the fetus for bowing of the arms and legs, which I mentioned before, or shorting, or any other bone anomalies. The method has been seen to be most helpful in diagnosing the most severe types of OI, such as type 2 and type 7, which are considered to be most lethal and can cause death at birth. Um, and also these, these two types are when the, these bones of the arms and legs are most prominent. Fetuses with milder forms of OI have not shown evidence of sustaining fractures or deformities before birth. Therefore, uh, if there is no evidence of OI in family history, like in mine, it would not have been picked up, and therefore it would not have been diagnosed. The ultrasound procedure can be carried out anywhere between 13 to 16 weeks uh, after conception to identify the symptoms if present. Then we have uh, chronionic vitreous sampling, or CVS. This test attempts to detect uh, for specific anomalies, abnormalities in the fetus rather. To achieve this, a sample of cells is taken from the placenta, uh, like this, and tested for genetic defects. This procedure comes with the risks of miscarriage of, uh, and also a uh, chance of birth defects to the baby. This risk is further increased if this procedure is carried out between 10 weeks into the pregnancy. The recommended time frame for this procedure to be carried out is between 10 to 13 weeks after conception. Finally, there is amniocentesis. 
This tries to assess whether the fetus could develop or has developed an abnormality or serious health condition. This process involves a needle being used to extract a sample of the amniotic fluid as illustrated in the lovely diagram behind me. Amniotic fluid is extracted as it contains cells which have been shed by the fetus and this can be examined and tested for a number of conditions. Amniocentesis can be carried out between 15 and 20 weeks into the pregnancy. As with CVS, this is also an invasive procedure and it can ca come with a risk of a 1 in 100 chance of miscarriage. This then would suggest that amniocentesis and CVS would only be carried out on families who have either had a history of OI or the parents themselves have OI. If there are no reasons for these tests to be carried out during maternity, and this child starts to present symptoms after birth, then there are a few methods of diagnosis which can be carried out, namely a skin punch biopsy or a co and collagen molecular testing. A skin punch biopsy, or more medically correct, a collagen biochemical test, looks at the collagen proteins made by the skin cells or fibroblasts, and this requires a dermal uh, punch biopsy sample or more literally, a small sample of skin which is taken from the individual presenting the symptoms. This test looks for evidence of abnormalities in the folding of the collagen. However, this test does not provide a final, final diagnosis as to which type of OI the individual has. In order to identify this though, a collagen molecular test would be requ required. A collagen molecular test, or DNA analysis, looks for mutations in collagen by sequencing at a genetic level to spot an anomalies in the pattern. In order to do this, either a blood or skin sample is required. To date, there have not been any cures for OI found. All treatments in place are to minimize symptoms and to try and improve the life quality of the individual. There are a few main ways which I would like to talk to you about. Firstly is rodding. This came as a result of uh, work by Dr. Root and his colleagues, which involved a procedure which segmented bones, then inserted long rods through these segments. This procedure, though, is not recommended to everyone with OI. It is only suggested to those who have curved bones or have broken certain bones repeatedly over a period of time. People with more severe types of OI may tend to opt for this type of treatment, as, this is more likely to, as they are more likely to experience more extreme and more frequent fractures. And it may be a way for them to increase their quality of life and also reduce their recovery times rather than being treated by plates and screws and pins. There are two main types of rotting. Uh, oh, this is what rotting looks like in an individual who's had rotting in place. There are mainly two types. The first one being non-telescopic, which is that one. These are most commonly used in children who have very short and thin bones. So in very young people, that's what is used. And uh, obviously these do not grow with individuals, so therefore it calls for repetitive surgery to be uh, implemented in order to uh, cure, I mean, to, as the individual grows, to, in order to replace the uh, rods. And also there are telescopic rods. Telescopic rods are, as you can imagine, like a telescope. They come in and out and they would grow with the individual. This would uh, require there be to be a less a need for repetitive surgery as there can be a greater length of time in between the surgeries to press these rods if needed. Uh, the telescopic rods are obviously bigger than the non-telescopic ones and therefore are only used in individuals with larger bones such as in teenagers and adults. These surgical interventions have all got the core belief behind it that the most important goal in the orthopaedic arsenal in treating those with the OI was best to directed to minimise deformities and to encourage normal function. And rotting can be said to achieve both of these goals. As in the first instance, rotting provides more support to the structure of the bones. This allows the individual to have a higher chance to achieve greater mobility and achieve greater independence. Now, moving on to looking at the pharmaceutical interventions to minimise symptoms of OI. One of the main pharmaceutical treatments of OI is the treatment of, is the administration of biphosphonates. Biphosphonates are used to prevent the loss of bone mass and typically are used to treat diseases such as osteoporosis. The name biphosphonates comes from the fact that they are, have two phosphon, phosphonates and assist in the increased coordination of calcium ions. 
The administration of biphosphonates bind calcium molecules together and as the largest store of calcium is accumulated and stored in the bones, it re results in high concentration of calcium in the bones. There are various types of biphosphonates which have been trialled and eventually put in place to treat people with OI. One of the most commonly used biphosphonate drugs is known as permidronate. Permidronate is a drug administered intravenously and it is designed to inhibit bone respiration, reabsorption rather, which is a natural ongoing process uh, of bones being destroyed by osteocast, as I mentioned before, in order to get rid of tissues which no longer function well. Bone resorption happens as a part of a process known, uh, known as bone remodeling, which is basically the building, the breaking down of, and the rebuilding of dynamic bone tissues. Studies of bones with patients with OI have suggested that the abnormal activity of osteocast and osteoblasts contribute towards uh, greater bone fragility. Imperfect bones are more susceptible to osteoclasts, so OI bones is reabsorbed more quickly than, no than new bone, than normal bones rather. Through inhibiting bone reabsorption, it allows the individual's bones not to be forming newer and great greater imperfect bones, and therefore allowing the individual a better chance to reduce their fragility. In addition, as the bone reabsorption rate reduces, it also slows down the rate at which the osteoblasts become less, ef less efficient at what they do, therefore again slowing down the rate at which the individual's bones are becoming increasingly fragile. The use of permitted rate to treat patients has shown fracture incidence decreasing as well as showing an increase in bone mineral density which is what this graph shows. Uh, this has been demonstrated in a few test cases uh, in the diagram behind me. Individuals with osteogenesis imperfecta have very low bone mineral density. And therefore, to, uh, one of the things tested to ensure that the permitted rate is having an effect is to me measure the bone mineral density of individuals receiving it. I've, I've been receiving permitted rates since 2005, November, so I've been having the treatment for about eight years now. And I can uh, gladly say that it's been having a very positive impact on myself. Before receiving the permitted rate, I could safely say I've had over 100 fractures to the legs and to my arms. And since then, the injuries which I've sustained have been very mild compared to the injuries I used to have before get, receiving the pitronates. I believe one of the most severe injuries I had was I was just lying in bed, I just turned around onto my stomach and I just lifted my legs up and my legs just snapped. One of my femur broke and I was in traction for about six months, which was rather unfortunate. But since receiving the pitronates, things have calmed down a bit and I haven't had any fra severe fractures in over two years. And the fractures which I have sustained are not, not typically down to me. I think the last fracture I had was there were a girl ran into my chair backwards, not looking where she was going, and she hit the side of my chair, and the chair tipped sideways onto the concrete. It was in the playground as I was going home, and I hit the side of my ribcage on, on my armrest, and uh, I only came out with a couple of bruised ribs. But before receiving the pituitary, I would have had uh, definitely a few broken ribs and a fractured arm. Uh, at the very least. However, there has been some speculation over the long-term effects of permitronate on the OI patients. Concerns have been raised over the quality of bones being affected by the prolonged use of it. This has risen from the knowledge that permitronate suppresses bone turnover during the length of the treatment. Leading to concerns, this decreased remodelling may prevent repairs to micro damage to the bones. Especially any small injuries or hairline fractures which are experienced by OI sufferers will not recover as a result of prolonged use of this drug. So uh, the small fractures which I had uh, since having the bigger has meant that my recovery time has been a bit slower, but it has kept the larger fractures at bay. Uh, there have also been concerns that individuals receiving this drug may develop osteochronosis of the jaw, which causes lesions, uh, which are wounds or injuries, uh, to, to developing, which develop exposing bones of the mouth and your jaw. The chances of this, of this occurring are exacerbated if there is poor, de poor dental hygiene in the individual, or the individual has poorly fitted dentures or certain uh, dental procedures. All these increase risks of the individual getting osteochronosis for the jaw, as bacteria forming uh, and infections coming as a result of this, which causes lesions to occur and the osteochronosis reduces the chance of, chances of the healing. Now, looking at methods which are currently being, uh, which are being looked at in terms of trying to further reduce complications caused by OI, bone marrow transplantation is one of them. 
In my research, I have found that in 1999, Horowitz uh, trialed this method in St. Jude's Research Hospital in Memphis. The idea of this trial was to transplant bone marrow taken from siblings into three children who had suffered multiple bone fractures and deformity from this heritable disease. They describe improvements in bone marrow density, better growth, and fewer fractures, all occurring during a relatively brief period after the marrow transplantation. Bone marrow is a substance found in the cavities of bones, especially in the long bones and the sternum, which is the breastbone. The bone marrow contains those cells which are responsible for the production of blood cells, uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So by replacing bone marrow from the same gene pool, the hope was that it would reduce, reduce the fracture rate and the other benefits mentioned. Statistical association has shown links between poor bone density and higher probability of fracture. And as people with OI have relatively low bone density, the transplant should increase it. The three participants in the study all showed accelerated growth rates prior to the treatment, as before they, sh uh, uh, as be as before they were below the average height for their respective ages. Secondly, they all de demonstrated increases in their total body mineral count, showing that the treatment had increased density of their bones, uh, increasing the strength of them. And finally, fracture rates went down from a median of 10 during the trip period of six months prior to the treatment to a consistent median of two, which carried on for years after the initial treatment. However, due to the nature of this treatment, there are a few risks which the patients experience uh, who participated in this trial, which include uh, developing sepsis, uh, transient pulmonary insufficiencies, hygromas, which is a buildup of fluid in parts of the body, as well as GVHD, which is graft versus host disease. GVHD is a common complication in treatments which involve tissue transplants, like in bone marrow transplants. The problem with this is that the immune cells, the white blood cells from the tissue, i.e. the bone marrow, recognise the host as foreign and tries to attack the host body cells to try and get rid of it. While the chance of this happening is... Um, is reduced as they are from the same gene pool, the complications are still there. While they were all treated without complication, it does have more side effects than the pimidronate does. The pimidronates, I should mention, have side effects uh, which range from fevers to shaking to uh, vomiting, but that only happens after the first admini administration of the pimidronates. After that, side effects don't tend to show up. This is merely a trial that has provided a solid foundation for future trials to be carried out on the subject. But the authors of this paper, uh, including Horowitz, concluded that there needs to be a more complete knowledge of mensenchymal mens cell biology would be needed to carry this further. Now, I think we're coming on to my favourite part of this talk, cats. Now, how many of you have cats or know people that have cats? Just by a simple show of hands. Good, that's pretty much all of you then. Fantastic. Uh, now, this does have some relevance to this topic, I'm not going crazy here. Uh, now you all know that cats purr, uh, and it's all cute and adorable and lovely. Uh, there are many reasons why cats purr. Uh, do any of you care to know why cats purr? Do you care to suggest some ideas why you think cats purr? No? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, cats tend to purr for many reasons. Firstly, if they are hungry, if they're in pain, if they're giving birth, or if they're about to die. Now, their purrs resonate within a frequency of between 25 and 150 hertz. Purring is a kind of self-medication for cats, and vets have noticed over a long period of time that cats heal quicker than dogs, from burn, especially from burn injuries. The frequency which emit while they're purring is, some, is a type of self-providing physical therapy. In the late 1990s, Dr. Rubin in New York found that... Uh, being exposed to low-level frequencies, such as uh, the vibrations given off by cats when they purr, can help to keep them healthy and help build uh, bone density. And have helped them to sh and the frequency that they purr has also been shown to help them heal quicker from bone fractures. Turkeys, rats, and sheep have also been struck to vibration plates, which I shall talk about in a second, have all been administered this uh, treatment with the same vibrations as cats purr, and they've all shown marked improvements in their bone strength. Now, the relevance of all this to OI. This method of whole body vibrations has been taken on by humans for trials for people with OI, and at the moment it is being trialled at Birmingham Children's Hospital under the control of Dr. Hogler and Dr. Shaw. 
who I've been in, in uh, email contact with throughout my project just to find out more about their project because it's something that I didn't know about prior to starting it. Whole body vibrations involves tra uh, training on a machine known as a whole body vibrations platform, which is that, which is a small scale one we used on a very young child there. The principle behind it is that whole body vib that the vibrations at low frequency will ha activate and induce changes in the muscular system. This hope is to increase the muscle force, and due to the link be between muscle force and bone strength, is ho it is hoped that this method will allow the symptoms of OI to be reduced. The participants of this trial are asked to stand on the vibration platform twice a day for nine minutes at a time, and uh, this test would be last for about six months. Dr. Hogler, one of the leads on this trial, commented the medical outcomes his team wanted to observe from this technique in the first instance is improved mobility, as well as, as, well as improvements in bone structure, mass and density. This will be measured after the six months is over uh, by a six minute walk test and also uh, by measuring on a force platform. Uh, force platforms are measuring, uh, are measuring instruments like the one uh, over there and they measure the ground reaction force, that is the force exerted by the ground to the individual who is standing on it. Uh, in order to assess the individual's balance, gait and other measurements needed for the test to test for improvements. Right. We have uh, looked at trials in place for people with OI. We have also looked at potential treatments for those with OI. Now we are going to look at what the future for OI might be. Gene therapy. Oh, no we're not. We're going to look at this first. <laughs> uh, this is uh, a trial which was carried out in Cologne in Germany in 2007. Uh, this was uh, a whole body vibrations which was carried out in 2007 uh, with a very small sample set of 14 all with uh, people who have osteogenesis imperfects of varying types, ranging from type 4 to type 7, I believe. And as you can see, the results are all very positive. And um, the side effects of these are very limited compared to all the other techniques which have been used because it's, all, it's obviously very low vibrations and therefore compared to other types of physical therapy which are not advised for those with severe OI as obviously they fracture faster and the only other physical therapy which is suggested for those with OI is swimming but this is a very low impact way of trying to build up bone resist, uh, bone density as well as uh, strength of the bones. Right, now we're going to look at gene therapy I believe. Fantastic. Uh, now we will come back to Dr. Joan Marini who I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Uh, she outlined three main types of gene therapy as a way of trying to manage a condition such as OI in her book. There are three main ways which I outlined here. The first of them being mutation suppression. Uh, as type 1 is the least severe type of OI, mutation suppression endeavours to suppress the mutant gene in other types through the use of hammerhead ribozymes to make the individuals have biochemically type 1 OI. This reduces symptoms and greatly improves the life quality, but this method of therapy is still in development and using animal models and is yet to be trialled on patients with OI. Uh, the second type, replication of natural examples of mosaic characters. Mosaic characters are individuals who have the condition but are clinically normal due to the proportionality of normal collagen and defective collagen they have. This method was tried in a human fetus in utero using fetus in fetal mainly chemal stem cells, uh, which is uh, extracted from the bone marrow of the individuals. But the clinical outcomes of this were complicated as, the, as during the infancy the child was treated with biphosphonates. But there were some claims of improvements in growth and in total bone body mineral content. More research is needed to be carried out on this type of genetic therapy. The final type, gene transplantation. This method involves targeting of the COL1A1 and the COL1A2 gene, which causes the first two type, four types of OI, as mentioned in the first slide of my talk, typically uh, using the uh, adeno-associated vectors in adult, adult mincing chemical cells. This method at the time of her writing was only found to have a success rate of less than half of 1%, where success is defined as normal collagen being produced by the targeted cells. This is the method I'll be looking at in particular detail now, as it is being looked at by Ali and Hassan in their work. Ali and Hassan took the gene therapy plan, which is involved 
uh, in the bone marrow stem cells used by Horowitz and his colleagues in 1999 to 2000, as I mentioned previously, and developed upon this initial idea and came up with the idea of using fluorotannin incorporated mensenchymal cells as a waste of boosting cellular differentiation into becoming healthy bone forming cells. Horowitz, a uh, bone marrow trans stem cell treatment at the time, was not backed by clinical support, although the initial trials of this showed improvements in all the patients that it was tried in, uh, with patients showing an improvement in total bone, bone mineral content, and there was an increase in their respective growth velocities as well as reducing their factor rates. The illustration behind me will help me to explain the process put forward by Ali Hassan, as well as by the Molecular Therapy Journal, which was uh, this was published in, in 2012. Step one, the mesenchymal cells are extracted from the bone marrow of the individual with OI. In stage two, the virus, uh, which is used to stop the function of the extracted stem cell, is known as the adeno-associated virus, which is talked about by Joe Marini. The virus is, stopped to use, uh, is used as it is a predictable virus and has the ability to integrate itself into the host cell at a specific site of the gene which is very important because we need to target the, uh, the specific collagen gene which we're trying to cure. Another attractive feature of this virus in gene therapy is that it is a small virus which infects humans and is currently not shown to be responsible for any uh, other diseases and it only causes a very mild response from the human immune system. This makes it a rather favorable choice as other methods of gene therapy may have many undesirable aspects uh, as discussed previously such as tumors, and other things as well. Ali and Hassan wanted to reduce the number of side effects, so they chose to use this method. The virus is combined with the gene for producing the defective collagen, which inhibits the part of the gene which codes for the defective collagen, and hence activating the gene for normal collagen production. In this step, this is where Ali and Hassan is, Hassan's differ from Horowitz, as in this step, they incorporated fluorotans. Fluorotannins are rather interesting, and it was something that I wasn't too sure about when I started uh, doing my research into it. And they were incorporating the fluorotannin into their mesenchymal cells. Fluorotannins are found in brown algae, and they say that it stimulates protein production. And it minerals and collagen synthesis. Therefore, not only in this process is the defective collagen corrected, there is a boost in the quality and the quantity of the collagen produced and it also increases the bone strength of the patients that it's administered in. Step four. Um, yeah. uh, this, this is then combined with the cells which is originally taken from the individual. Uh, these cells have now become genetically altered. These altered cells are then injected back into the original patients, into the bones. The altered bones, the altered cells rather, then start producing normal collagen and start creating more bone than the original uh, mesenchymal cells were producing. The reason behind this working uh, is providing that the infected host with the affected cell, altered cells, may allow a shift in the level of balance between the synthesis of the mutated and normal collagen chains, and thereby converting a severe OI phenotype into a less severe one. This method has only been shown to work in laboratories at present, and is yet, therefore, uh, yet to be trialled on individuals with OI. Finally, we have reached the conclusions of these talks, and there are three main talks which I would like to refer back to. Uh, obviously, one of the first things I'd like to talk about in, is in order to try to achieve a goal of trying to find a cure for this, uh, there are a few barriers which need to, uh, we overcome. Firstly, in uh, attracting funding into medical research for children and young people. Statistics have shown that there is significantly less spent on children and young people research than there is in adult research. Currently, only 3% of all funding put into research is being placed into children and young people research. It is important to achieve a greater level of funding to be placed in children and young people research, as my report has shown a majority of complications present themselves in childhood. As most of the, as obviously the individual grows, the bones grow, and as the defect of collagen increases while they are younger, they are more susceptible to the fractures and therefore it's important to intervene as early in the child's life as possible to improve their life quality as well as their condition. Uh, therefore it's imperative that we uh, intervene as soon as possible and that is simply not possible without having getting increased funding. Secondly, the whole body vibrations. Uh, we have uh, obviously know that the trial in Cologne worked uh, exceptionally well. 
uh, even though there was only 14 test cases, they all show significant improvements, small improvements, but significant for an individual with OI. And uh, we are hoping that the trial in Birmingham will go just as well, and I will be in contact with Dr. Hogler and Dr. Shaw to follow up on these trials just to ensure that uh, the results are in line with what Cologne came up with. And finally, the stem cells, which I mentioned with Ali and Hassan, obviously their work is still in laboratory stages and yet to be implemented in actual individuals with OI, but it's a very exciting prospect. And with the use of stem cells being used to treat a majority of different conditions, I think it's really important that we take that step forward and to try and treat osteogenesis imperfectly because it's a very rare condition and there's loads of people suffering in silence and I don't think that is right. In order to put a better time frame on this, uh, in order to assess when I think a cure for osteogenesis imperfecta would be found, I thought the best method to do was to compare it with an another genetic condition. And in order to, and to compare the progress in both, in order to analyse the speed at which progress is occurring in OI, if it's, and if it's the same uh, with another genetic condition, or if it is slower in trying to reach the final goal. I chose cystic fibrosis, you can see the timeline on the left hand side I believe, uh, cystic fibrosis is a life-shortening disease, inherited, it's an inherited disease, as with osteogenesis imperfecta, affecting almost 10,000 people in the UK. People with CF have uh, their lungs and digestive systems clogged up with mucus, as the gene which regulates the movement of salt and water in and out of the cells is defective, which makes it difficult for those with CF to breathe and to digest food. As with OI, a cure for CF has not been found, and the research and therapies have all been have all been surrounding regarding improving life quality at the moment, as well as life expectancy. I believe this is a good condition in which to compare it with OI in order to estimate the time scale for which our, our, our cure for OI may be found. Uh, as you can see, uh, OI was found very early on. It was discovered about almost 300 years ago, uh, whereas the first comprehensive medical report for CF was only in 1938. I believe that in the last 20 years, you've seen a very significant uh, increase in the amount of trials and improvements in uh, the improvements for CF and the treatments. Obviously, you can see the life expectancy has grown since they've started work on it. And obviously, mapping the human genome project has uh, contributed a great load into gene therapy because it helps to identify which uh, gene the defects lie on and therefore it allows the researchers to identify which genes to correct. And obviously, uh, as I had identified in 2006, we found the recessive OI gene, which is also a very good step forward because up, and up until that point, we only knew of the dominant ones. And now we have a clearer picture of how, of all of the types of OI, it's a, we have a much better scope for trying to cure all of them. I believe with the work that is going on now, uh, I would believe that in the next 20 to 30 years, I would estimate a preliminary basic cure to be found for OI using stem cells as the basic point to start with. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk and I will open to any questions that the floor may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Can I ask you a question about stem cells? <coughs> yeah, come on, stop recording. Yeah, sorry. Uh, do you foresee there being any problems? I can't remember what the final decision was in the States about stem cell research, but it's quite controversial, isn't it, the use of stem cells in research? Mm. Uh, I do agree that it is controversial, but looking into the best interests of the patient, I think stem cells are crucial to try and eliminate the suffering that people go through, especially at a young age, because especially with type 2 and type 7, which is very severe and can lead to death. I think the use of stem cells can preserve life, extend life, as well as um, improving their life quality. And I think uh, stem cells should be used as a way of uh, looking on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think stem cells is a very good way forward for it. And I think it should be assessed as such. Yeah, I mean, I agree. But do, do you think the consensus around the world have got stem cell research? Sorry, I didn't hear that, sorry. I, I mean, I agree with you. But, but, there, but there is some controversy about it. And I was wondering if you think the consensus is likely to be that it's okay. Uh, I think it should be, and I think it should, the consensus should change, because I, I, I do understand where the uh, disagreements of it come from, but I believe there are more pros to it, especially in certain conditions more than others, for, there to be, for stem cells to be used, and there are cons. Yeah. Uh, any more questions from the floor? And do you have siblings? No, I'm the only child.
Well, my parents were again, uh, advised against having any more pregnancies because uh, they believe that. Oh, the, another thing I should mention is that every time someone with either a carrier of OI or uh, so my parents weren't oh, affected by OI, but mm -hmm. obviously they were carrying the genes for it. But every time they would re reproduce, the chances of them having another child with OI is obviously 50, about fifty percent. But doesn't mean that the type the child will get is the same as what I have. It could be a a, a milder type of OI, which could be type one, or it could be more severe. So my parents were advised against uh, further pregnancies. Yeah, any more questions? Okay, and that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.